Okay, I started to look at Psalm 81. I know I need to do Psalm 81. I'm sorry, you might hear my son giggling in the background. He's playing something right now. Um, and I started to read it on my own, but I realized I'm not going to have time to read it on my own and then record. And I think Psalm 81, I was led to. So I'm just going to go ahead and study it right along with you guys. So we start in verse 1. Sing aloud to Elohim our strength, right? The Lord is our strength and our fortress, right? Make a joyful shout to the Elohim of Jacob. Hallelujah. Raise a song and strike the timbrel, the pleasant harp with the lute. I believe, and I haven't pre-read it, but I believe that Psalm 81 is going to be, remember, in striking Egypt, he's going to heal it. And his kingdom is going to be established, never to be taken from the earth. I think this is the flip side. This is the establishment of the kingdom. This is what those who love Yah are looking forward to. Through all of our weeping over all of that we're hearing about all of the bad things that are happening around us, this is where our hope is, right? It lies in the Holy One of Israel, in Yahushua HaMashiach, the, who is mighty to save. And the establishment of his kingdom, so that finally we can live in a world that is not a world of dualism, dark and light. But finally, we can be in the light. Blow the trumpet at the time of the new moon. Now, having studied the new moons and... Um, the different reckonings of um, the months and such. I know that this word is not new moon. So let's take a look at it and see what it really is. So the easiest way for me to do that is just to come to the verse and click on new moon. <clears throat> Excuse me. So new moon is Kodesh. And it doesn't mean moon or even month. If we come down, because I've done the study before, um, it actually comes from the word kadash. Because the word for moon, if I remember right, is yadayah. Yadayah has nothing to do with kodesh. So this is not new moon. Um, so kadash is the word that it comes from. And kadash means to renew or repair. So now with that in mind, let's go back and look at what this really means. So blow the trumpet at the time of the renewing or repairing. Remember what we read in Isaiah 58 about the fast that he wants us to do. It says, you shall raise up the foundations of many generations those who truly have what they're supposed to have in their heart. They will raise up the foundations of many generations and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. So let's go back to what we were just reading. Blow the trumpet at the time of the repairing, the renewal, the restoring. I believe that this is going to be talking about that sacred assembly that's going to happen in what will be termed the New Jerusalem eventually, but is happening in the land of Egypt as is talked about in Isaiah 19 that I've read so many times. Um, but Isaiah 19 is just so pivotal. Without this chapter, we really couldn't unlock this. It says, in that day there will be an altar to Yahweh in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to Yahweh at its border. And it will be for a sign and for a witness to Yahweh Sabaoth in the land of Egypt. For they will cry to Yah because of the oppressors. So they're going to be under a vice. And he will send them a savior and a mighty one. Of course, Jesus Christ, the savior and the mighty one. And he will deliver them. Then Yahweh will be known to Egypt and the Egyptians will know Yahweh in that day and will make sacrifice and offering. Yes, they will make a vow to Yahweh and perform it. And Yahweh will strike Egypt. He will strike and heal it. They will return to Yah 
and he will be entreated by them and heal them. That is what is being talked about here, I believe, in Psalm 81. <clears throat> Excuse me. Blow the trumpet at the time of the new moon, at the full moon, on our solemn feast day. So blow the trumpet at the time of the repairing, the restoring. At the full moon on our solemn feast day. Let's see if that is Yadea, if that is moon. So we'll go back to that verse because I don't believe that's moon. Because like I said, I've looked at this one verse before when I was studying about the times and seasons and the new moons and all of that. Notice it is not Yadea, it is Kese. And here it says Kese is full moon, but there's some really important things to look at when you're trying to understand things. Number one, it's only used three times. Look, the word origin is of uncertain derivation. So how can they assign a meaning to something if they don't even know the origin of the word? They're just assuming that that's what it means. And look, it's only occurs twice. Psalms 81.3 and Proverbs 7.20. We can go look at Proverbs 7.20 to see why they may have defined it that way in Proverbs 7.20. Um, I'm actually going to um, go to the full chapter because I usually like to read a couple verses ahead so I know what the context is. I have spread my bed with tapestry colored coverings of Egyptian linen. <clears throat> now since I believe that this is talking about um, Egypt in, you know, in the prophecies of Isaiah, I find it really interesting that, um, it's talking about Egyptian linen here. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with love for my husband is not at home. Oh, this is a woman that's gone whoring. Okay. So this is Hosea. Hosea, the, the woman that, that is a harlot, um, is the northern kingdom. That's what's being talked about in the book of Hosea. For my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey. He has taken a bag of money with him and will come home on the, look here, it's, it's um, being translated as on the appointed day. Because it was 20, right? 720 that we needed to look at. Let me just go back one. It was 720. So here it's on the appointed day. Um, now something else. Let's let's just read a little a little further. Um, oops, I didn't notice what the letter was. Let me go back and see what the letter was. It's letter F, and it is here. It says at the full moon because sometimes it's being translated as that. But let's go back to Strong's and let's read a little bit further. Let's come down here and see if there's any more. Um, that we can look at. So full moon, um, the origin of that being what it means is dubious. Um, perhaps an Assyrian loan word like Kuseya, headdress or cap, um, as like the tiara of the moon god. I'm going to tell you right now, um, in our sacred scriptures, um, we're not going to be talking about tiaras of moon gods when we're talking about um, blowing the trumpet to our Elohim. That's not going to happen. So that's definitely not where the word came from. Let's go on. Um, and then um, let's see if there's anything else that might be being said about this. All right. It could also come from time appointed or kase, apparently from kasa properly fullness okay let's go that there so kasa is to cover from a primitive root closed clothed concealed covered oh wow forgiven hidden wait a minute taking refuge are you seeing what i'm seeing Okay, so now let's use those words. So blow the trumpet at the time. Oops, my brain just, just had a brain fade. Hang on. At the time of the renewing or repairing. At the, instead of full moon, it would be at the concealment or the hiding. 
um, or the covering on our solemn feast day. So this is really interesting. So this is a time of renewal or repairing for those who have been concealed or hidden. And it is a solemn feast day for this is a statute for Israel, a law of the Elohim of Jacob. This he established in Joseph as a testimony when he went throughout the land of Egypt, where I heard a language I did not understand. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Didn't we just read in Isaiah 19 that they speak the language of Canaan, right? A language I did not understand. Um, and it's calling that land Egypt, right? And it is Joseph. It is the um, northern tribes um, who are led by Joseph where this a new covenant is first established whoa okay so one thing that I'm also noticing here is something that I've run into many times where something is to happen in the future but it is spoken of as if it already happened in the past and I had looked this up before with something because I was certain it was prophetic and that it hadn't happened in the past and yet they were using perfect and imperfect verb tenses to talk about it now this very statement okay um, the one that we just read about um, this will be established as a testimony in Joseph when he went throughout the land of Egypt um, where I heard a language I did not understand. Obviously, all of that is being written in past tense as if it's already happened. So we're thinking, well, Joseph was already in Egypt. So this already happened and I'm confused, right? Um, no, this is called, look at this. This is, this he established, perfect, past perfect, okay? Um, let's see, I heard, imperfect. I did understand, past perfect, Okay, this is called the prophetic past tense, and it's used throughout the Bible. So I'm going to read this little bit to you. Um, I went and looked it up again just now while I was doing this video. It says in the Hebrew and Aramaic idiom in which the Bible was written, when something was absolutely going to happen in the future, it is often spoken of as if it had already occurred in the past. Hebrew scholars are familiar with this idiom and refer to it as the prophetic perfect, the historic sense of prophecy, and the perfect of confidence. Students studying Semitic language and thought sometimes call this idiom here now, but not yet, or already not yet. Unfortunately, the average Christian has no knowledge of the idiom. So I feel like what we're dealing with here is that um, prophetic perfect where it has not yet happened, but it is certain to happen. So they tell it as if it's already happened in past tense. So let's just look at that again. Blow the trumpet at the time of the restoring at the at, at the hiding or the covering on our solemn feast day. For this is a statute for Israel, a law of the God of Jacob. So it looks like in the future, this is going to be a day that is going to be um, remembered. It's going to be a statute for us to remember this. And doesn't that go right back? Oh, guys, you know what just dropped into my head was, um, oh my goodness, I feel like the Holy Spirit is just opening this up. Um, Joel, let's look at Joel. What does it say at the very beginning of Joel when we come into this time when it tells us to blow the trumpet, so wake the drunkards and weep? It says, hear this, I'm in verse Two, it looks like ye elders and give ear all you inhabitants of the land has anything like this happened in your days or even in the days of your fathers tell your children about it let your children tell their children and their children another generation look at this this is being set as something to be memorialized something to be remembered year after year which is exactly what we are reading here in psalms it says this is he established in joseph as a testimony remember this is prophetic past so it hadn't happened at the time that the psalm was given but it was so sure to happen that it was told as if it was past tense this he established in joseph as a testimony
Sorry, I had to ask my sweet boy to please be a little quieter. This he established in Joseph as a testimony when he went throughout the land of Egypt. When I heard a language I did not understand. Let's just go right back just to tie that last bow. Let's go to Isaiah 19. What did it say there? Um, in that day, five cities in the land of Egypt will speak the language of Canaan and swear by Yahweh Sabaoth. One will be called the city of destruction. Or if you go to the Vulgate, it's something different. Um, um, the city of the sun. Or um, in another version, it is the city of righteousness. So it just depends on which version of the scriptures you're in as to how they're going to do that. So going back, um, wow, I feel like, I feel like something has been just blown wide open today. I removed his shoulder from the burden. That's exactly what Isaiah tells us. Okay. And this is interesting because this is, um, it starts out here. Um, this is about the Assyrian being destroyed from the land. Um, Yahweh Sabaoth has sworn, saying, Surely, as I have thought, so it shall come to pass. And as I have purposed, so it shall stand. So it would make sense that they would talk about this using the um, using the um, prophetic past, right? Because that's what that is supposed to tell us, is that it is certain. We can stand on this, okay? It says that I will break the Assyrian in my land and on my mountains tread him underfoot. Then his yoke shall rem be removed from them and his burden removed from their shoulders. This is the purpose that I purposed against the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out over the nations. For Yahweh Sabaoth has purposed it. So, yeah. So, um, it says, then his yoke shall re be removed from them and his burden removed from their shoulders. That is exactly what we're reading right here in Psalm 81. I removed his shoulder from the burden. His hands were freed from the baskets. You called in trouble, the time of Jacob's trouble. We have heard a voice of trembling, Jeremiah 30, of fear and not of peace. Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with child. So why do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labor, and all faces turned pale? Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. And it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he will be saved out of it. That is exactly. And let, let's go down. I just, I was just scanning and what did I see in the very next verse that I had forgotten about for it shall come to pass in that day says Yahweh Sabaoth that I will break his yoke from your neck and will burst your bonds foreigners shall no more enslave them but they shall serve Yahweh Sabaoth and David their king whom I will raise up for them praise Yah therefore do not fear O servant Jacob says Yah nor be dismayed O Israel for behold I will save you from afar and your seed from the land of their captivity. There it is. I removed his shoulder from the burden. I'm back in Psalm 81. His hands were freed from the baskets. You called in trouble and I delivered you. I answered you in what? The secret place of thunder. What did it say right here at the beginning? What did we just read? Blow the trumpet at the time of the, of the repairing, of the renewal, at the hidden place or the concealment on our solemn feast day and what did we just read just here i answered you in the secret place of thunder i tested you at the waters of meribah and what does meribah mean we need to we need to understand that at the waters of strife or contention those were the in the um story of the exodus there was a time many times actually but one time in particular when there was a lot of strife and division among israel um and that was um when um well actually we'll just look at it hang on right i thought it was when moses struck the rock but i wasn't sure so i'll just use the summarizer um the waters of meribah refer to two places in the bible where the israelites quarreled with god about their need for water in the desert the first location was a rock at the foot of mount horeb also called mount sinai in an area known as rephidim 
shortly after the Israelites crossed the Red Sea during their escape from slavery in Egypt. The people complained of thirst, and Moses and Aaron sought the provision of Yahweh, striking a rock that poured forth water. The resulting stream was named the waters of Meribah, where the people of Israel quarreled with Yah, and through them he showed himself holy. So let's go back. I answered you in the secret place of thunder. I tested you at the waters of Meribah. So there was a drought. And what is it that we're told in the scriptures that there in the last days, it won't be a drought, a famine of food, but of hearing the word of Yah. So here we are in this time of drought and he's testing us to see if we are going to stay faithful and believe in the Holy One of Israel. Or are we going to become angry and and cry out against our God? This is the moment that we're going to be in. And I know that we're not going to cry out against him. We are going to be tested at the waters of Meribah and we are going to hold faithful. And we are going to trust that the living waters are going to be restored and that we will be in a land full of righteousness again that we will no longer be in this place where there's nothing but bitter waters. Hear, O my people, and I will admonish you, O Israel, if you will listen to me. See, see, we're in this moment when we have to learn to listen. There shall be no foreign God among you, nor shall you worship any foreign God. I am Yahweh, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it right? Being full of living waters, okay? The tree that is planted by the river of water, right? Um, Who's um, gives fruit forth, gives forth fruit in its season and its leaf doesn't wither. That's who we have to become. But my people would not heed my voice. Okay, now this isn't talking about the remnant. But of course, he's going to be lamenting that the majority of those who claim to be followers of the Mashiach, followers of Christ, the majority of them will not listen. But he's already promised us that he's going to break that yoke off our backs. And yeah, we just have to trust in him. But my people would not heed my voice in Israel, would have none of me. So I gave them over to their stubborn heart to walk in their own counsels, the grand delusion that it talks about. He gave them over to... Um, the desires of their heart to their own grand delusion. And, and, and um, like it says in Isaiah chapter 28, you know, they were, all the tablets were filthy and they were um, taking in these filthy um, precepts of men, um, precept upon precept and line upon line until they stumbled, fell backward and were trapped. But we're not going to do that. We instead are going to turn to the word through the Holy Spirit as our guide. That is what we're going to do. We are going to walk in his counsels and not our own. Oh, that my people would listen to me. What did he say? Um, How many times, Israel, would I have gathered you? Like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. But we are going to. We are going to go into that place under his wings of hiding because we are going to listen that Israel would walk in my ways, I would soon subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their um, adversaries. The haters of Yah would pretend submission to him, but their fate would endure forever. He would have fed them also with the finest of wheat and with honey from the rock. Honey is wisdom. And the rock is Yehushua Mashiach, is Jesus Christ. I would have satisfied you. So he's going to feed us with honey with wisdom from the rock and you know let's just go back to um isaiah 28 where he makes that promise to us there too um i thought i had isaiah 28 open uh it's okay i'll just open it real quick it's weird because i thought it was open so we'll go to isaiah 28 And it says, um, uh, 
Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily. And with honey, wisdom from the rock, he's going to satisfy us. We are not going to act rashly. Why? Because we're on the rock. Heavenly Father, with all of my heart, I pray that you will strengthen me and my brothers and sisters, that we will stay on the rock, that we will be able through all of the darkness to trust in the Holy One of Israel, in Jesus Christ, that he will be our rock, our sure foundation, our savior in times of trouble, that we will cry out to him and he will save us. I say this in the name of Yahushua Mashiach, Jesus Christ. Amen.